Good evening, I'm Mike Knetter. Welcome to the UW Now live stream series where we bring you experts from the UW community to talk about timely and important topics. Tonight's topic is international relations and specifically the increasingly tense relationship between the US and China. Whether it's geopolitics, intellectual property, global trade or military might, these nations do seem to be on a collision course. And in fact, one of tonight's guests wrote a fictional account of how we could stumble into the next world war. Joining us tonight, we have Professor Jessica Weeks, the H. Douglas Weaver Chair in Diplomacy and International Relations at UW-Madison. Her articles have appeared in top academic journals, such as the American Journal of Political Science, the Journal of Politics, International Organization, and World Politics. Her book, Dictators at War and Peace, was published by the Cornell University Press and explores the domestic politics of international conflict in dictatorships. Weeks is the 2018 recipient of the International Studies Association Carl Deutsch Award, recognizing the scholar under 40 who has made the most significant contribution to the study of international relations. Professor Weeks received her BA from Ohio State, a master's in international history from the Graduate Institute of International and Development Studies, and in and a PhD in political science from Stanford University in 2009. Thanks for joining us, Jessica. And kicking us off tonight is the former Supreme Allied Commander of NATO, Admiral James Stavridis, currently an operating executive of the Carlisle Group and chair of the Board of Counselors of McClarty Global Associates, following his five years as the Dean of the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts. A retired four-star Naval officer he led the NATO Alliance in global operations from 2009 to 13 as Supreme Allied Commander with responsibility for Afghanistan, Libya, the Balkans, Syria, counter piracy and cybersecurity. Previously, he also served as commander of the US Southern Command with responsibility for all military operations in Latin America. Earlier yet, he commanded the top ship in the Atlantic fleet as well as a squadron of destroyers and a carrier strike group, all in combat. He earned more than 50 medals, including 28 from foreign nations, in his 37-year military career. It seems like you must have been around for 100 years because <laughs> Admiral Stavridis is also widely respected for his analysis and judgment on global affairs. He earned a PhD in international relations, has published 10 books, hundreds of articles, and his TED Talk on global security has nearly a million views. He is a monthly columnist for Time Magazine and chief international security analyst for NBC News. There's even evidence, Jim, that you are something Americans can agree on. In 2016, he was vetted for vice president by Hillary Clinton and subsequently invited to discuss a cabinet position in the Trump administration. And his recent New York Times bestseller, 2034, a novel of the next world war is the launching pad for tonight's discussion. That does seem like several lifetimes of work. I don't know how you do it all, sir. But uh, first, Admiral, let me thank you for taking time from your busy life to share some of your insights with our Badger alumni and friends. So if you would, please share some remarks about your latest book, why you wrote it, how this story could become a reality, and maybe a bit about how we might avoid that. And then once you've finished, I will invite Professor Weeks and our audience to throw some questions your way. So thank you, sir, for being here. Uh, we really appreciate it. And uh, the floor is yours. Uh, Dean Knetter, uh, my dear friend, Mike, um, often you and I who serve on a corporate board together, appropriate, particularly for a former dean in the business school, will share a martini together. I wish we could be sharing that martini tonight, but something even better. We share uh, an intellectual conversation about where the world might go. In the world of badgers, I have a very dear friend, Dr. Richard Boxer, who is observing tonight. He is one of the recipients of the uh, top alumni award uh, for 2021 for your very fine medical school. So it's a pleasure to be with um, all of you from the Wisconsin Network. And I look forward as well to uh, Dr. Weeks and her thoughtful and I'm sure probing questions. Let me bring up just a couple of images, if I could, to kind of set the stage about a book that I recently published. And um, 
Dean Knetter was nice enough to mention it hit the New York Times bestseller list. It was number six. You know, I thought in a long life I would do a number of different things. I never guessed I would be a New York Times bestselling author, and I'm far from a Stephen King or a Daniel Steele. But uh, the book's done very well, and I think it's a testament to how concerned we ought to be about the possibility, as Mike said, of these two nations, US and China, kind of sleepwalking into a war. Next slide. Let me begin with a question I get asked a lot, which is, why'd you write a novel, Admiral? You know, I'd written nine books of nonfiction about leadership and character and geopolitics, the oceans. The short answer is, I wrote a novel about the future because I looked to the past. I looked to the Cold War, and I'm an aficionado of Cold War literature, both film and novel. So you see Dr. Strangelove, you see The Bedford Incident, Failsafe. There are a plethora of novels and films in which we imagined how horrible it would be if the US and the Soviet Union, if NATO and the Warsaw Pact managed to get into a war, undoubtedly it would have been a nuclear war, would have been devastating for the planet. We managed to avoid that. Part of the reason we avoided it is because for decades, we could imagine in novels and film how terrible it would be. When I then looked at our looming tower of a potential war with China, it occurred to me there is no such literature today. So I set out to write a novel to try and tell the story of how terrible it would be if we managed to sleepwalk into a war with China, a war that neither nation needs. And so with that as preamble, next slide, I had the fundamental thought that so often in our history, a disaster occurs. 9-11, Pearl Harbor, this pandemic we're suffering through. And so many times the disaster occurs and yet all we can do is convene a four-star commission to look at it, to try and understand what happened. Wouldn't it be incredible if instead of waiting for the disaster, we actually imagined our way into the future and said, how can we avoid this? And so to some degree, 2034, a novel of the next world war is actually not predictive fiction. People say to me all the time, oh, Admiral, are you telling us what the future is? My answer is, I hope not. I hope it stays on the fiction list. This is not predictive fiction, it's cautionary fiction. Next slide. So let's talk about China and our challenges with this authoritarian regime. And of course, Dr. Weeks is an expert in understanding how authoritarian regimes unpackage their vision of the future. And they have one great advantage over democracies. They have a streamlined system of decision-making. They have a top-down system of guidance. And this goes back thousands of years to Darius the Magnificent and Cyrus the Great of Persia through hundreds of different regimes through Joseph Stalin in the uh, Russian early days of the 20th century to today, Vladimir Putin and President Xi both enjoy a very streamlined methodology in making decisions. They can say, in the case of China, our strategy will be one belt, one road. We will focus on a land route to the north, a sea route to the south. You know, this is like Paul Revere, one if by land, two if by sea. I on the opposite shore will be. Um, we're on the opposite shore. And China has a clever, thoughtful strategy. Next slide. And... As a result, we have a pretty rich basket of disagreements. Upper left, cyber, we're in a shadowy cyber war already. Upper right, a rising Chinese military, particularly their Navy, 
challenges the United States. This may surprise you. China has more warships than the United States of America. Let me say that again. China has more warships than the United States of America. Ours are bigger. They deploy further. We're much more experienced, many more nuclear powered. China has more warships than the United States. Bottom right, China's trade and tariff practices are sharp elbowed to say the least. Bottom left, China claims the entire South China Sea. They're building artificial islands in order to buttress that chain. And in the center, 5G network, the future of the internet, the future of global communication. We are in a real struggle over will it be Huawei or will it be a US Western concern? And there are strong arguments that it should be the latter. Next slide. Next slide. Let me make a point about this because I believe this piece of geography is the most profound disagreement between these two nations. This is a map, a chart, we would say in the Navy business of the South China Sea. It is huge. It is a vast water space. To put it in perspective for you, it is half the size of the continental United States of America. It's the size of the Caribbean and the Gulf of Mexico combined. China claims it as territorial seas. The United States appropriately claims territorial waters 12 miles off our shores. China is claiming a land space of 1,500 miles. We're not going to surrender to this view, uh, and we shouldn't. In addition to being a huge body of water, it's full of hydrocarbons, oil and gas, rich fishing fleets and vessels ply these waters, and 40% of the world's trade passes through it. We can't simply acquiesce in this vision that China owns it. This will continue to be a challenge. Next slide. In addition, China is mounting a pretty significant cyber campaign against the United States focused on intellectual property theft, but really edging into the kind of work that Russia has done, frankly, quite effectively against our electoral system. So it's a rising naval capability. It's the South China Sea. It's this cyber. Next slide. Next slide. Next slide. And it's also human rights. Upper left is a woman named Carrie Lamb, who is anything but a sacrificial lamb. She is the administrator of Hong Kong. She is the factotum of the Chinese Communist Party, which has now dominated this city state, which was supposed to enjoy a very unique system of governance for 50 years after the 1997 handover from the British. Today, that umbrella revolution, you may recall, is crushed, it's over. At the bottom, these are Uyghurs, Muslims, who are imprisoned, forcibly sterilized in their millions. This photograph taken in the Xinjiang province of China. And that's before we get to, next slide, Taiwan. And, you know, a lot of people say to me, oh, Admiral, you're overstating the issues with Taiwan. You know, they're small, they don't matter, they're a little island. I don't think so. This is an island, yes, with a population of around 35 million people. And it's the 32nd largest economy in the world. It's the largest chip manufacturer in the world. China is determined that they will pull the Taiwanese into China. And Taiwan has a distinct culture, history, language. I do not believe they will go gently into that good night. We'll see. One other thing we ought to watch, next slide, is the growing, here's a diplomatic technical term, the growing condominium between Russia and China. 
condominium is kind of not quite an alliance and a little more than an alignment. It means kind of like you live in a condominium together. Vladimir Putin and President Xi, like in Jerry Maguire, they complete each other. Um, President Putin has a vast land area full of natural resources, not many people, population going down. President Xi has a relatively small land area. When you look at the arable land in China, he has a massive population, very few natural resources. In fact, I often say Vladimir Putin ought to be careful what he wishes for in this relationship because when China looks at Siberia, and by the way, Siberia, that's Russia to the east of the Ural Mountains, about two thirds of Russia, it's a vast land area full of gold, diamonds, oil, gas, rare earths, arable land, water. Looks pretty good. The Chinese look at that the way my dog, my dog's name is Penelope, she's a basset hound. The way my dog looks at a ribeye steak when I put it on the counter before I put it on the grill. It looks really good. Russia ought to be careful, but the point is Russia and China are drawing closer and closer together. Next slide. And we also ought to watch the relationship between China and Iran. Upper right, most folks will recognize the flag of Iran. Upper left, those are the battle flags of Darius the Magnificent and Cyrus the Great, two ancient Persian emperors. That map down at the bottom, I'd forgive you if you said, oh, Admiral, that's the area in the Middle East where the Iranians are trying to exert influence. No, that is the land area of the Persian Empire 2,500 years ago. I'm Greek American, so I'm required to point this out. You'll notice that Greece was never conquered. The Iranians don't see themselves as a kind of annoying mid-level power. They see themselves in every sense as inheritors of an imperial tradition. That's why in the novel 2034, you see that relationship between China and Russia and China and Iran deeply fulfilled. Next slide. So the last of the national characters in the novel is India. This is the golden temple of Amritsar, sacred to the Sikh faith. India, in my view, when we measure this 21st century, 200 years from now, when a historian looks back, this century will be less about the rise of China and more about the rise of India. India plays a very surprising role in the novel 2034. And whether or not India is prepared to play that role by 2034, who knows, it's a novel. But by the end of the century, will India be a profoundly impactful player in geopolitics? I guarantee you. Why? Because of demographics, because of being a democracy, because of many, many linkages already existent to the West, so look for this geopolitical player, India, to play a surprising role, certainly over the next 10 to 15 years, but I would guess even more so as the century unspools. Next slide. So there are some wonderful characters in the book. I won't walk you through all of them, but I want to put a line under another important aspect of the 21st century. You know, we often say it'll be about the rise of China or the rise of India or maybe the decline of the United States, although I don't think so. But I'll tell you what, again, that historian 200 years from now will say. She will say the 21st century's most salient characteristic is that it is about the rise of women. One of the principal characters who opens the novel is Commodore Sarah Hunt. She is commanding three destroyers clipping through the South China Sea. She reports ultimately to a commander in chief who is a woman. This will be a significant aspect of the 21st century. Next slide. There'll be some throwbacks. Um, 
Major Chris, call sign Wedge Mitchell. Hey, he's right out of the volleyball scene in Top Gun, which by the way, the sequel is coming out this summer. He's old school. And you know, Wedge is the oldest tool known to man. It's the simplest tool known to man. That's this Marine Corps major flying a fighter jet. He meets a one-star Iranian Brigadier General who is battle-hardened, but has a surprisingly complicated side to him as well. Next slide. And by the way, my favorite character in the novel is not that destroyer captain Commodore Sarah Hunt. The person I identify with the most is the Chinese Admiral Lin Bao who is complicated. His mother is American, his father is Chinese. There's a tinge of suspicion that follows him. When the novel opens, he's in Washington, DC, driving a desk. All he wants to do is get back to sea, get on a Chinese warship, be with sailors. Um, there's a lot to like about Admiral Lin Bao. And by the way, his great ambition when he finishes his military career is to become an educator. No higher calling, in my view, than to be a teacher, an educator. Mike Kinetter, this one's for you, to be a dean. This is, in so many ways, what I chose to do when I finished my time. And Lin Bao has that aspiration. There are twists and turns in front of Lin Bao. Next slide. And lastly, back to the theme of India, the Deputy National Security Advisor is Indian American, Dr. Sandy Chadhuri. And because of his connections to his family back in India, retired Vice Admiral Patel, India again plays a very surprising role in this story. Next slide. So that's a look at uh, the novel 2034 and I hope you enjoy it. I hope you have a chance to read it. Again, it's it's often miscategorized as predictive fiction. It, it's not, it's cautionary fiction. And as I always say, you know, number six on the New York Times bestseller list, I'm thrilled. I just wanted to stay on the fiction side of the house. With that, um, I'll turn it back over to uh, Dean Knetter and Professor Weeks and let's take it wherever you would like. Well, thank you, Admiral. Um, I hope you can hear me okay. You will note I've yep. changed locations. My wife- You have, went out. I guess the question would be, are you now in an undisclosed location like Vice President Cheney? <laughs> I am not, but uh, we're testing our backup systems tonight, I guess. Professor Weeks, thanks for coming on with us. And uh, I know you gave uh, the Admiral's book uh, a read over the weekend, and I just wanna hand it off to you to ask some questions. And then we'll take some questions from the, from the chat as well from our audience. Yeah, so well, thanks so much uh, for inviting me. And it's really a huge privilege and, and just fun to be able to ask you questions about this fantastic book. Um, you know. It's it's a great read and it's exciting the way one would hope, but it also I think from a more intellectual standpoint, really walks people through how could you end up in this catastrophic large scale war? I don't want to give too much away, but it's not like a happy tale. How do you end up in a, in a conflict like that, even when no one intended that at the outset, or at least not the two major actors? And so walking us through step by step how that could unfold through miscalculation and sort of bad actors and, and the internal politics I thought was, was really fascinating. So I have a ton of questions for you about that, about the, the sort of assumptions that you make and, and especially getting your opinion about where we are today, sort of on the road to some of where the book ends up. So I thought the first place I would start is asking you about cyber war and the sort of cyber angle. So in the book, the first event that sets off the whole conflict is China attacking some naval vessels in the South China Sea. And one of the key factors in Chinese decision making is the fact that it 
believes that it has this complete dominance over the US in the cyber realm. And if China hadn't believed that, I think the book makes clear it would not have attacked in, in that case. So that is that belief in its own dominance is, is a key a, a key element to, to war happening. And so I'm curious, sort of on a scale of one to 10, how worried are you that China could achieve the kind of dominance that could become a part of the puzzle? And do you have thoughts on what the US should be doing or maybe is doing to prevent that from happening in the next 15 years? Um, Professor Weeks, Dr. Weeks, Jessica, um, on a scale of one to 10, my worry factor is 12. And I, I, I say that because I've seen the intelligence, I've been inside the military and um, perhaps more importantly in the current moment, I'm close to um, Dr. Um, Eric Schmidt, former chairman of Google, who is an expert on artificial intelligence and the comparative advantages of these two nations in that world and former Deputy Secretary of Defense, Bob Work. And for anybody listening, if you wanna get a sense of where this is trending, take a look at their recently issued report, National Security Report on Artificial Intelligence. And it, it lays the case out pretty starkly that unfortunately the United States has failed to make a series of investments from basic STEM, science, technology, engineering, math, investments at elementary school, junior high school, high school, uh, higher education. We have failed to invest in basic research and development. We're frankly still living off the seed corn of the R&D we put in place after the Second World War. We have failed to appreciate the challenges of this rising tide of Chinese involvement. And China uh, is the mirror of what we've done. They've invested deeply in all these things. And then frankly, what really worries me, if that wasn't enough, is that um, the key to artificial intelligence in the end is data. It is controlling vast pools of data, which is what China is doing because data is the new oil. If you own data, you can then derive uh, all of the machine learning, the algorithms that will push artificial intelligence. And by the way, if that weren't enough to worry you, that's before we get to the impact of something that'll happen toward the end of this decade, and that is quantum computing, which will increase the complexity, the opportunity and the challenges of what we think of today as cybersecurity and cryptography by a factor that's difficult to articulate, but let me put it this way, current cyber is based on one and zero, one and zero bits. With quantum computing, you are using the position of subatomic particles, essentially in an infinite matrix to communicate the data. I don't want to drag anybody into physics in which I got a C in high school, but I will tell you um, it will make immensely different all the challenges we face. So Jessica, I'm concerned. And I think the question is, what do we do about it? Mm -hmm. The answer is sort of the flip of what I just said. We invest in STEM, we invest in R and D. We create, this is more controversial. We create a cyber force just like we have an army, a Navy, an Air Force, a Marine Corps. We just created a space force. We need a cyber force. Doesn't have to be huge, small numbers, talented individuals, put them together. We've got a lot of work to do in this. And bottom line to conclude, your supposition is correct. And that's the cautionary tale in the novel 2034 is if an opponent believes they can blind the elephant. They can negate all of your conventional advantage. They will be much more likely to provoke, to go to war, to create that miscalculation that creates the events of 2034. Thank you, Admiral. So my second question is about the South China Sea, which again is part of the whole chain of events that, that kicks off 
the conflict. So in the book, there's this Indian official related to one of the main characters and, and sort of at toward the end of the book, he's reflecting on what has happened again, don't wanna spoil it, but people are dead, a lot of people. And he's basically asking, was this all worth it? And the spirit of his question is, how much is the South China Sea worth? How much is Taiwan worth? It wasn't it, isn't it possible that these two great powers could find a way to reach some kind of agreement? Um, and really what what is victory bringing to the US in this situation? And so I'm curious, maybe from a literary standpoint, who whose voice is that? Who is this? Who, who is he channeling? Is it you? Is it someone else? And, and if it's not you, I'm curious about your opinion about the South China Sea in particular and U.S. interests there. I think Taiwan is a separate issue and maybe we could leave that aside for now. But South China Sea, how much does freedom of navigation really matter? Um, you know, how, how much should the U.S. be willing to give up? Yeah, I, this is a gut question for the 21st century. And that voice is very much mine. I have commanded destroyers in the South China Sea. I've sailed those waters as a Commodore, just like Sarah Hunt. I've commanded a carrier strike group in those waters and in combat in the Arabian Gulf. And, and I get it. It sounds really esoteric, right? The South China Sea, where is that? It's like in the who cares category. And if China wants to run that, fine. Why should we worry about it? Here's why we ought to worry about it. Again, it is an enormous land mass. So it happens to have water over the top of it. But if we were to acquiesce in a land grab of a land area, half the size of the United States of America, um, the signal that sends to the international community is devastating. And let's even stay with the fact that it's water. Um, it blows up the Law of the Sea Treaty in which um, essentially every nation has agreed that we will limit our ownership of the oceans to 12 nautical miles territorial seas, 24 miles contiguous zone, 200 miles exclusive economic zone. If we say to China, yeah, you can have the South China Sea, you can control all those ships, you can have all that oil and gas, the temptation in the international system is immense. So Jessica, I'd turn the question around, you're a historian, and I'd say, this is roughly like saying, ah, you know, if the Germans wanna, you know, roll through the Sudetenland and they wanna roll through Austria and they wanna roll through, you know, Alsace-Lorraine and, you know, kind of push the edges on France, it's no big deal. I think it is a big deal. It happens to be in the maritime space. And I don't want to over dramatize this, but let me tell you, if we simply say, go ahead and take it on the South China Sea, there's really no end to the land grabs that are out there. And Russia would then move into Ukraine. Um, I, I could recount a number of nations that would move into different areas it would not be the right signal for the international system and it would aggrandize China in a way that would be, I think, deleterious to the um, international security construct going forward. Could I follow up with that? Because there are different scenarios by which the U.S. could withdraw or, you know, could, could relax its claims. And one that some political scientists and policymakers have suggested is some sort of grand bargain where the US and China negotiate an agreement that gives China most of what it wants in the South China Sea. Could, could an agreement, in exchange for other things that the US wants, could an agreement like that avoid the kind of land grab, free for all, negative signal to the international system that you're worried about? Or do you think inherently the US stepping away is, would be problematic? Um, I am never an absolutist. I always say any problem is not an on and off switch with a binary answer, um, you know, on or off. Um, every problem in international relations is a rheostat. You, you 
you dial it in like the dimmer in your dining room you turn it up you turn it down so could we come up with a construct that might be viable absolutely um, on the other hand uh, one of the great quotes i was given personally by henry kissinger who probably knows more about china than anybody else and i had roughly this conversation with him and he said that yeah you can understand that concept he said but the solution to every problem is only a key to the door into the next and more difficult one i think this might be in that category so i'm all for negotiation i'm all for finding a way to work out what we want to do in these waters, but I'm not for turning the South China Sea into the functional equivalent of uh, the Great Lakes between the United States and Canada, because they're not, they're international mm -hmm. waters. Thank you. I have so many more questions to ask, but I do believe we have questions from the audience. So Mike, should I? pass back to you. Sure. Yeah. Why don't um, I'm going to throw out a question from Eric Johnson, who I think <laughs> has a view that many people do that perhaps um, China has more people and maybe less regard for human life. And how can you really negotiate with someone that has that much more leverage than you do? Um, I don't know if this is my friend Eric Johnson from Tufts University or not. If it is, hello, Eric. Uh, if it's a new Eric Johnson, um, hello, Eric, as well. Um, I think that at the end of the day, if I can boil the question down, it's who wins in a situation between an authoritarian regime and a democratic regime? And I think there's a short-term, long-term answer here. Um, I think in the short term, a lot of advantage accrues to authoritarian regimes because they are streamlined, because they can function by diktat, because they can, as Eric says, they can simply do what they want. You know, this goes back to the Peloponnesian Wars, the, the strong do what they will, the weak suffer what they must. Um, yet, the long throw, the long game, I'm going to bet on democracy. And, you know, we can have that debate. Uh, Winston Churchill, who knew a fair amount about authoritarian regimes and democracies, said famously, democracy, it's the worst form of government, except for all the others. And the reason is because of human nature. Because at the end of the day, people don't want to be dictated to. People want to have a voice. We see that today in the issues of social justice in the United States. People want a voice. They deserve a voice. In the end, they'll get a voice, my opinion. And as I look at uh, what China can do, I think in the short term, they can push a lot of positions forward. But Fundamentally, China is like a pot that's on a stove full of water. There's a fire under it. It's boiling. And there's no safety valve. Democracy is a safety valve at the end of the day, right? You, you elect Barack Obama. You get tired of him. You elect Donald Trump. You start the fire again. And you get tired of Donald Trump. You get to elect Joe Biden. China doesn't have that. And you put a pot on a stove with a fire under it, sooner or later, I think it's going to blow up. And I don't know if that's 10 years from now, 15 years from now, 200 years from now. But I'll close with this, Mike. If you look at the history of political science, it tends to favor democracy. 100 years ago, 150 years ago, how many democracies were there? About 15. Today, you can argue the numbers, probably close to 80, maybe 100. 
the long throw of history is on the side of human nature and therefore on the side, my belief of democracy. I wouldn't bet against it. And so my answer for Eric is China will continue to beat the drum of nationalism and President Xi will attempt to dominate his political system. And he will. And China has been an authoritarian regime for millennia. I wouldn't bet against democracy in the end in China. Could I get one more comment out of you on a question that, that's really in, in your wheelhouse? Sure. Joan Lappin wonders, do we really need the conventional aircraft carriers and the <laughs> like in a world where there's you know so much cyber capability and now we have drones? It's a great question, Joan. And I think back to the image of on and off switch, I, I don't think the answer is, yes, we need 12 nuclear-powered aircraft carriers and 12 conventional aircraft carriers, which is what we have now, or no, we need zero aircraft carriers. The answer is, right now, we have about 20-plus of these massive machines of war. Personally, I would start moving that dial back, saving money, and spending it, your point, on cyber unmanned vehicles, special forces, hypersonic, space capability. We're not going to do that instantaneously. We've got to dial it back. And a secondary comment is, although we are correctly seized with the idea of our next potential conflict will be with China, I'd just like to remind everybody, you know, the best boss I ever had was Secretary of Defense Bob Gates who was director of CIA for 30 years and then secretary of defense for eight years. And Secretary Gates likes to say, you know, our record of predicting the next war is perfect. We've never gotten it right. Um, that's a pretty salient point. I mean, who would have guessed 20 years ago would have a 20 year war in Afghanistan. And today we're all seized with the idea of a war with China. We may be in a war with you name it, Turkey, Japan, Australia. I mean, these are absurd propositions. Are they more absurd than the idea that we'd be in a 20 year war in Afghanistan 20 years ago? I don't think so. So Joan, my answer is those aircraft carriers could come in very handily in a second tier conflict against North Korea, Iran, uh, a regime in Venezuela. There are a number of scenarios I could cast. So I wouldn't consign them to the dustbin of history, but your point, I'd start dialing the rheostat back a little bit. Well, thank you for your time, Admiral. It's been great to have you here with us. And um, I know you've got to run, you had a hard stop. Thanks for staying a few minutes over. And uh, uh, I hope to see you in person before the year is out. And toast you in person with one of those martinis that was mentioned. Indeed. And anyone who wants to know, uh, Dean Knetter likes a, 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 uh, a Keitel um, martini dirty with two olives. See you later, everybody. Thanks. Whoa, I've been outed. Okay. <laughs> but he's got to brush up on his vodka. His kettle one. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, <laughs> Jessica, I know you've read the book. Um, tell us a bit about um, kind of your thoughts. Uh, you know, you can maybe grade the Admiral's book and presentation uh, from your position <laughs> on the faculty. Yeah, I mean, I thought, it, like I said, I thought it, it was fascinating um, in the way that it makes you think through all of the steps by which you could get to a fully fledged military conflict, right? Because obviously, neither side is looking for that at the outset. And so the question from the standpoint of a political scientist is basically, how do you, how do you get to that point? And the answer usually ends up having to do with each side having information that it's private to itself. So something that it knows or believes, but reasons not to be able to share that with the other side. And I think, I don't know if the Admiral was formally thinking in those terms when he wrote the book, but you, you see that those ideas very much in the book. So in the sense of China having this cyber capability um, that's secret from the US. And, and the problem here is 
China can't let the in the book can't let the U.S. know this because then the weapon would become less valuable, and so that we call it information asymmetry between the U.S. and China uh, can create huge problems because if the U.S. had known that China had these capabilities, it would have taken a different course. So. You know, I, I could talk about many other ways in which I, I'm really sympathetic to the way that the Admiral is thinking about things. Um, one thing I wanted to comment on, sort of relating more to the comments that he just made about democracy versus dictatorship actually relates to my own research. So the Admiral said that that in the long, in, in the short run, authoritarian regimes may be able to have, may have some advantages um, in mobilizing their populations and fighting wars, but in the long run, they have disadvantages. And so I think that is largely what political scientists think, but in my own work, actually, I've looked at differences among authoritarian regimes. And I think this is really interesting and relevant to Chinese politics today. So when political scientists were thinking about dictatorships versus democracies, they were thinking of this sort of stereotype of a dictatorship where there's one person, usually a man at the very top, who's totally unconstrained by any kind of domestic politics, um, therefore has the luxury of making risky decisions, um, you know, personality traits can come into this. And also, um, it, however, then has the disadvantage of, of not always being able to keep the lid on the population the way that the Admiral was saying. And so that's a sort of stereotypical view of dictatorship, which I think is well encapsulated by what the Admiral was talking about. But there are also other kinds of dictatorships that, although they don't offer freedoms to the public, have elements of shared decision making at the top. And so where leaders are more incentivized, not because they necessarily are worried about revolution or, and they're certainly not worried about elections, but they're worried about their own skin within this elite political system that they're in. And those kinds of regimes, I don't think it's so clear that they have the long-term disadvantages that, that dictatorships, as we had thought of them previously, do. And so the question is, what kind of dictatorship is China? Is it the type that maybe is is dangerous in the short run, but that you know could be beaten by democracies in the long run? Or is it the kind that's actually a little craftier and more thoughtful because those elite politics force the decision makers to be? And so I think that's one of the big interesting questions about China today. And unfortunately, I think well, is it fortunate or unfortunate? I th China seems to be going a lot more in the direction of this sort of one man rule, we call it personalistic system. So the bad news there is that those kinds of regimes tend to be more erratic, tend to be more aggressive, um, more likely to use military force for various reasons. I suppose the silver lining is that often because they miscalculate, they are a little bit easier to beat. So it's just to offer a nuance on this idea that there's just democracies and non-democracies. There's also a lot within that spectrum and the question of where China is, I think is a really important one. Yeah, that's a great observation, Jessica, and kind of relies on that dial that the Admiral was turning several times in his answers. <sighs> um, there is just more nuance and, you know, uh, Xi isn't totally unconstrained there are very powerful elites in China. Um, the party obviously has quite a bit of leverage, but you wonder at what point um, that could unravel. Mm -hmm. um, I have a question for you, and, and it really relates to, you know, obviously the Admiral had a military career, had a lot of access to information, uh, has a PhD himself in international relations, so very well equipped to, to speak on these subjects. But how much interplay is there between the academic community studying international relations? And as you've noted in our discussions, you know, you're know you looking uh, not in detail at China or any one country, but studying authoritarian regimes throughout history more broadly. But do you find it useful to interface with um, former policymakers you know, after they're able to 
you know, speak openly about their views and what they know, or former military uh, leaders like the Admiral, is that something that academics are interested in? Oh, absolutely. I, I mean, they're a huge source of valuable data from my standpoint, and that they have experienced some things up close and personal. They have access to information that academics will only have access to in many decades down the road. Um, so just the, the access that they have and, and the depth at which they've looked at a particular issue is incredibly useful. I would say that what you always have to keep in mind is that typically policymakers, not all of them, obviously not at very high levels and, and the Admiral's one of these, but often policymakers are looking at a limited snapshot of history. They're looking at a limited range of countries, right? They only can observe what they saw. And so you just, as an academic, you have to keep in mind that um, you can't always generalize from every personal observation because they could have seen a, a selective snapshot or um, maybe they only were dealing with one country and the dynamics involving a different country would have led to quite a different conclusion. So I would say absolutely fascinating to get their stamp, their their input. I mean, it's, it's crucial, it is the data. Um, I think, I think the, the bigger question is what, well, not the bigger question. For me as an academic, I, I am always interested in what policymakers feel that they can get from academics. And I think there are a lot of initiatives underway. Um, I mean, there's always been a sort of interplay between academia and policy with many top policymakers having spent time in academia. I mean, this has a long history, but I'm seeing, I would say almost a renewed effort today to sort of try to bridge the gap between academics and policymakers to leverage the strengths of each one. So on the policymaker side, those up close and personal decisions and insight and the rich expertise in their area. And then on the academic side, thinking about sort of, well, how do we know what we know, what we think we know? How can we, um, what was the method by which you drew this conclusion? Do you really have all the data? Were you able to observe all of the relevant data points or did you see just a skewed snapshot that made you reach this conclusion? So I'm heartened to see the connections uh, that I see taking place between academics and policymakers, uh, increasingly even in recent years. Great answer. Um, a question from Gretchen Dykstra, and I wonder if you have thoughts about this. Um, Gretchen wonders, what do you think is China's end game, and and how how does China's um, objective maybe compare to other dictatorships today? That question gives me chills because this is one of the questions in international relations today, and there is massive debate about this. Of course, it's you can't just look inside China's metaphorical brain and figure that out. So we have to infer that from, from what we can. And I'd say, to me, the most persuasive view is that China's overarching objective is its own survival and its stability. And everything else about Chinese policy flows from that. And so then the question is, what does China need to keep its current regime alive? And, and this is very important because like most dictatorships, the Chinese government knows that if there were a regime change in China, it could literally be life or death for the people inside the regime. I mean, liberalization is frightening, like physically frightening. And so so you you, need, you just need to keep that in mind when you're thinking about the objectives of the Chinese government. So how does China, how does the Chinese government stay in power um, in, in, and, and, and keep its regime stable? Well, a key element is economic growth, right? So China has moved away from the sort of traditional communist I ideology that we saw during the Cold War. It's being replaced with some other ideological components like nationalism, but a really key driver of Chinese stability and the support, the, the willingness of the population to, 
tolerate or even embrace the current government is the fact that it has been increasing Chinese standard of living. So ch part of the Chinese end game is, is continuing whatever it's, whatever the standard of living is that will keep the population relatively happy. Now there are also, as I mentioned, as, as China has been moving away from the sort of older communist ideology and embracing some capitalist ideas, um, it has been turning more to nationalism as a way to bring the people together and legitimate the regime. And this is a little bit of a double-edged sword because on the one hand, I truly, I think that, as I said, ultimately the goal of the Chinese regime is stability, but because it has legitimated itself in part through this nationalist ideology, it has sort of moved the benchmark a little bit in the sense that there are some foreign policy goals, you know, like the Taiwan issue, like control of the South China Sea that ha have a nationalist component. Um, so ultimately, um, how far China goes in pushing those foreign policy interests, eh, I don't I don't think we know exactly. I think the one area where I was maybe a little bit more optimistic than the Admiral, and, and this is more in the tone of his comments, not in anything very specific that he said, is I just think China is extremely pragmatic. And this desire for stability and this desire to minimize risk is a really defining feature of, ha has been sort of a defining feature of Chinese policy. And so if I had to guess, I would say that the end game is is again that that stability and what exactly that looks like in terms of foreign policy aspirations it it i don't exactly know yeah it's interesting i mean why couldn't it be that we could just both coexist as very successful and influential countries in different parts of the world with somewhat different allies i don't know why we'd have to be on necessarily a collision course as long as we understand they're about their own preservation, we're about ours. Do you think mm -hmm. they really want to um, aggressively control more of the world's resources and, and that, that desire is somehow unlimited or are they just trying to kind of cordon off their region? You know, and we talked about this earlier, Jessica, and maybe you could, you could say a few things. You know, the South China Sea, as the Admiral said, it's huge, um, it's maybe too, uh, grandiose of a claim by China. On the other hand, we probably wouldn't like it if the Chinese were doing military exercises with Mexico in the Gulf of Mexico, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, you know, do you think th there is such a thing as, you know, seeding some ground in acknowledgement of just their scale and stage of development? And, you know, uh, or are we going to continue to set all the rules. What are your thoughts on that? Right. I think there are a bunch of questions tucked in there. I, I think the question of is China, I don't think that China aspires to complete global domination in the way that sometimes it is portrayed as. I think it's very shrewd. It understands that that can lead to overreach. I mean, that's actually a theme in the book is that when empires extend too far, they tend to crumble over under their own weight. And, you know, China is is very astute about, about this. And so I don't think it wants to control the world. I don't think it wants to take over the Western hemisphere. Um, again, I think it's trying to make the world you know, a, a hospitable place for its own regime. And um, that if the U, my personal opinion is that if the US would cede a little bit more influence in those key areas where it's really has not just an economic claim, but also there these sort of national interests come into play. Um, as you said, every country wants to sort of control its backyard, the countries feel that's something that they deserve, then I think there it would be room for a, a compromise. Now on the US side, I also think that that feels very uncertain. I mean, to trust, to trust 
the South China Sea, which is a major thoroughfare for world trade to this foreign power with a completely different form of government is, is very unnerving to US policymakers for good reason. So I don't know that it's easy to construct a bargain that everyone is happy with, um, sure. but I wouldn't rule it out, yeah. Sure. Well, let's, let's take one final question if you're up for it from Ryan Yan. And that is, um, instead of trying to force countries to shift their political systems so that we're in conformance, we're all democracies with capitalist uh, economies, what pathways are there to cope with these large differences in ideologies? How do we uh, work toward peaceful coexistence with China? I think it depends on what the goals are. So if the goal is just peaceful coexistence and the US is willing to let China decide how to run things inside its own borders, then I don't think there's necessarily an unbridgeable ideological gap. I think China is very pragmatic. I don't think it's trying to export its ideology in the way that we saw, for example, in the Cold War uh, on the part of the Soviet Union. I don't think that's what China's up to. If on the other hand, the goal of the US is to try to fundamentally change China's human rights practices or to persuade China to liberalize, then I think we're at an impasse because as I mentioned earlier, this is a huge threat to the people inside the Chinese government. And you know, human rights abuses are, are not something that the Chinese government is doing for fun. It's something that it's doing because it feels that that's how it will hold on to power. It's, it's a uh, very goal oriented set of policies that are terrible normatively, but um, serve a, a, a purpose. And so I'm not sure that it, it will be very challenging for the US to change those behaviors within China. Um, obviously, people are working very hard at that, trying to sort of chip away with economic incentives and you know, um, sort of persuasive campaigns and, and hopefully slowly there can be some movement, but it will require adaptation on the part of China so that it can maintain that stability without you know, with letting go of some of its tools. So I think it will be a very slow process, if I had to guess. Thank you for uh, for sharing your thoughts tonight and querying the Admiral. Uh, what are we going to give the Admiral for a grade? Are we going to send him the Yeti for being on the show? Was it 40 <laughs> oh, yes. minutes? Was it? OK. And, uh, yes. I'm glad you had a chance. Do I get the Yeti? Here. Of course you do. Of course you do. <laughs> oh, we excellent. might even send the Admiral a shirt. I'm not sure he has a lot of badger wear since he did ask if we were the golden badgers backstage. Oh, yes. He needs I'm glad to that was off. backstage. Yes. <laughs> so, well, thanks for being with us and, uh, and joining the Admiral tonight. And uh, really a pleasure to have you on. And I'm sure we'll do this again. And uh, uh, wish you all the best in your, in your continued research. Thank you. And thanks for all the listeners and uh, their excellent questions. Really enjoyed yes, this. We had too many great questions to get to tonight. Um, Yes. But yeah. All right. Yeah. Happy yeah. to follow up offline if people have questions. So terrific. They know where to find me. We will take you up on that. All right. Well, thanks for joining us tonight. We'll be back again next Tuesday with an exciting show. We're plotting how we're going to top the Admiral's appearance. Um, that may be hard. Thank you. And on Wisconsin. You can try, but you'll never stop a badger. Because we badgers are born with curious minds and endless heart. When we see a curve in the road, we speed up. When there are mass shortages for first responders, we make our own supply chain. When there's a world on pause, we sharpen our claws. Through thunder, fire, and pandemics, we'll keep going. Because after all, you can't stop a badger. <laughs>